Welcome back to Put It on the Map. We're moving on now to Easton, Pennsylvania, a small town not far from the New Jersey border, the place where about 100 years ago, a couple of men developed a product that unleashed the artist in us all. Enter the Crayola Crayon Factory, and the smell that overwhelms you is like, well, you know how it smells. It's a childhood smell we never forget. It's a fragrance that comes from a few simple ingredients, the main one being paraffin. It arrives twice a week at Crayola in railroad cars holding 70 to 75,000 pounds of the stuff. Where it's put was explained to us by Crayon Manufacturing Manager Kevin Flanagan. These are our paraffin storage tanks here. Each tank holds 90,000 pounds of liquefied paraffin that we keep at 170 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point, we're able to pump the liquid paraffin into our manufacturing process inside the building. We did the math. These tanks take in and pass on over 15 million pounds of paraffin a year. The next step in our crayon process is blending. Here we are adding all the raw materials to make a crayon. We bring in 150 pounds of paraffin, which was heated outside in the silo. Next, we add a pre-measured amount of dry color. And the last ingredient that goes in here is 25 pounds of clay. The wax is poured onto rotary molds that contain just under 2,000 crayon-sized holes. The colored paraffin is now chilled in this rotary mold by cooling water. At the end of the process, the crayon is sufficiently hard that we're able to push it out of the mold and it's now ready to be transferred into our next step, which is labeling. The labeling machines apply a thin film of cornstarch adhesive to the labels before wrapping them twice around each crayon. At this clip, they're able to whip off 380 crayons a minute. Examining the crayons as they're moved from the labeling machines is where quality control meets speed and volume. I'm just looking to make sure that they all have good points on them, there's no holes in the back, like there is. All the labels are good. I'm looking for the perfect crayon. The perfect crayon, 600 at a time, set neatly into a box of 3,600. It takes expertise and patience. By the way, there are no loser crayons here. Every one gets another chance by being recycled, paper and all, in the mixer. Once the crayons have evolved into the form we know so well, it's a brand recognized by well over 90% of Americans, it's time to get them ready for retail sale. This is an example of one of our Crayola packing lines. On this line, you see operators taking crayons and placing them into a packer. The packer will then, in turn, insert 24 colored crayons into a box. This line is capable of producing 300,000 boxes in a single day. That comes to 12 million crayons every day, or 3 billion a year. Of course, the true end of the line for a Crayola crayon is not here, but here, where an idea forms in a child's mind and the wax meets the paper. The very first time that happened was in Easton, Pennsylvania. But the partnership of Edwin Binney and C. Harold Smith goes back just a bit further, to Peekskill, New York in 1885. There, Binney and Smith started a chemical company focusing on lamp black, used to toughen car tires, and red oxide, used in barn paint. In 1900, they made a move to Easton, where they opened a mill in which they started making slate school pencils. The education market was one Edwin Binney knew a bit because his wife Alice was a school teacher. Alice's colleagues soon asked for a chalk that wouldn't crumble to dust. The result was a dustless chalk that quickly won a gold medal at the St. Louis World Exposition. Alice next reported a need for cheaper, brighter crayons than the ones schools were buying from Europe. So in 1903, the partners unveiled their first box of crayons, priced at a nickel. The product's name arose out of a family dinner conversation at the Binney's, as explained by the Binney's great-granddaughter, Sally Chapman. And Alice Binney, being the school teacher that she was, said, well, dear, why don't we use the word crayi, which is the French word for chalk, and oila, which is the Latin root for oil. Let's combine them, and let's come up with something like Crayola. So that's where Crayola came from. As the years passed, the company flourished. At first, of course, production was slow. Much of it was done by hand, painstakingly labeling and packing the crayons. Children! Children! 
Ben. The company offered crayons as a way to expand kids' minds and even reduce adult stress. Introducing fast, fast relief for the tensions and discomfort sometimes associated with children. Relief that can last for hours and hours. Good old Crayola crayons. In 1990, the company, for the first time, retired eight colors. Do you wax nostalgic for maize? Well, so did rumps, the raw umber and maize preservation society that picketed the company to no avail. Three years later, the same year the town came out to celebrate the opening of the Crayola Factory Visitor Center, Fred Rogers and friend came to Easton to pour the wax for Crayola's 100 billionth crayon. It's estimated that by now over 120 billion crayons have been made in Easton since 1903. I believe that children are drawn to Crayolas or markers because it gives them a sense of freedom. No one tells them what to do. They can use all these colors, use their imagination, and for the time being, become an artist. And I think that's in all children, all adults, is that desire to be an artist. In 1990, Crayola said farewell to Emerson Moser, one of its longest serving employees. He made a record-breaking 1.4 billion crayons over 37 years. And it wasn't until he retired that he'd revealed he'd never been able to fully appreciate his work. You see, Emerson was colorblind. We'll be right back. Coming up, we're heading to a place where people have been picking peppers for almost 150 years. It's the key ingredient in a condiment that has graced tables from Kalamazoo to Khartoum. We'll show you how this business by the bayou makes its sauce when put it on the map returns. <laughs> 